more about rituals from a Jewish and spiritual perspective is Rabbi Harry Rosenberg, the man who wears many, many hats, and now he is the co-founder of a trippy.vc. Hello, Harry. It's always good to see you. Rabbi Harry, I should say. So let's talk about these rituals. We think about, you know, uh, Orthodox Judaism and the Talmud and the rituals having to do with the halakha. But what could you explain from all of your years of research about some of the other rituals that were going on that we not, may not hear about in, uh, you know, the mainstream Jewish tradition? I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And it's definitely a fascinating topic to discuss. I think we should just start off and rewind a little bit and go back to the beginning of time because right now we are in a situation that was a cause and effect of something that happened thousands of years ago in the Garden of Eden. And all of Jewish worship and religion is really just about rectifying that situation and getting out of it. Right. And a lot of our ritual is about that. So in the Garden of Eden, we have a situation where we have Adam sitting there in a state of bliss, and we're actually taught that the Garden of Eden is two separate locations. The Garden was a geographic place where he existed. Eden is a specific place within the brain where pleasure emanates from, and that's where Adam was dwelling, inside of his mind. If you actually look at the first words of the Torah, they could be arranged uh, instead of Bereshit bara Elohim, Berosh yit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created everything in the head. Um, so we see that Adam was somewhere in this Edenic consciousness in his brain, and at the time of his sinning, quote unquote, whatever that means, we teach that his light was sucked into the earth, into the form of sparks. And the purpose of the people of Israel is to create ritual around extracting those sparks from the earth. Right, and bringing the sparks back out, right. The first place those sparks uh, were concentrated in was Egypt. That's what our Kabbalists teach us. So the people of Israel have to form to go into Egypt to extract the sparks to then eventually rectify the sin of Adam and Eve. Wow, very, this very interesting topic about, let's start with the, with the two Edens. Does the second Eden in the mind have to do with the, the pineal gland where we experience pleasure and ecstasy and all of that? It's a great question. Uh, uh, we would speculate that it would be based on a list of many reasons that we've put together. Um, first of all, when Jacob gets tapped to be called Israel and actually form the nation of the people that will go extract these sparks from Egypt, he names the place Peniel after he has a metaphysical encounter with an angel. And Peniel in Hebrew means the face of God. Um, in English or in Latin, it's actually a, an eyeball structured gland in the middle of our brain responsible for secreting dimethyltryptamine, DMT, the most psychoactive chemical known to humanity that we endogenously produce inside of hum humans when we dream at night in our wakes. Wow, wow. So with that said, so when we're going back into the garden and the, whatever the sin was of, of eating an apple and obviously then the spark break according to Kabbalah and we're spending all these generations trying to put them together. So how is that done and how do rituals tie into that? So we can kind of re reverse engineer the story now and look back and be like what did they do and how was that the, the mechanism of atonement? So the children of Israel go to Egypt ready for this extraction mission and we actually bring with us um, a forest or saplings of acacia wood which most people don't realize is one of the most psychoactive plants in humanity, which from there you can extract DMT, dimethyltryptamine, the same chemical we have endogenously producing when we sleep at night, and if taken as a hallucinogenic, the most powerful one in the world. At the same exact time, ancient Egypt was worshiping um, the gods that they said were born from the acacia tree, uh, Horus and Osiris. So most Jews don't even realize we were bringing in a tree into Egypt that they at that time were worshiping as the res where their gods came from. And it goes so far that even Rashi, our commentator, says we would stare at these trees for the 200 years we were in exile there, and it would give us faith that there would be one day be a redemption. So these trees were something crucial to the whole entire mission. All of a sudden, we leave Egypt, and Moses comes out, and the Israelites go out, and we're in the desert, and we look at Moses, and we say, hey, Moses, we have all these trees that Jacob told us to bring and plant, and we cut them down, and we brought them with us. And Moses looks at them and says, you know what? I grew up in the house of Pharaoh. I know exactly what these people did with these trees. I know what these priests did. I know a lot of the worship and ritual around it. So you see, extracting the sparks from Egypt wasn't really a metaphysical uh, reality. It was literally a scientific process of um, which plants are perhaps storing certain quote-unquote sparks, which we can p perhaps look at as the word chemical. Uh, the Vilna Gaon says in the future, every spiritual Kabbalistic term will have a scientific one that parallels it. And so we leave with this, and then we build uh, the Temple of Jerusalem. And um, you know, first of all, we spent 40 years in the desert mastering plants and extracts and ketorah and incense. So it wasn't just a golden calf being built. There was, play, there was horticulture happening. Uh, the, the, alongside of it, yeah, because we know 
that the, um, the Arab Rav, the mixed multitude of Egyptians, had left Egypt with the Israelites, and they were high-ranking the magicians. So they weren't just regular Egyptians. These were people who were part of the schools of ancient Egyptian, you know, dark, dark magic. Um, but the whole process really culminates in the, the Holy Temple of Jerusalem, um, where the purpose of this uh, scenario was to fix the original sin of Adam and Eve. So what was the mechanism of how we atone for the sin of Adam and Eve? One day, once a year, one man, the high priest of Israel, would go into this room, the Holy of Holies, on Yom Kippur. Everyone's familiar with Yom Kippur, but no one realizes like what actually happened. So he goes in this room. He has, uh, first of all, he fasted for 24 hours. He, he hasn't slept. He's separated from his family for a week. He goes in with a pan of hot coals in one hand and a pan of blended incense on the other, in the other hand. And he goes into this room. It's a double curtain, so he walks in and around, and he puts the coals on the floor. And then he takes two scoops of incense and drops it on the coals. And from this bursts a big cloud of smoke. And according to Jewish law, codified thousands of years ago, he has to stay in that room until it's completely filled with smoke. He's got to wait a few minutes. And at that point, and at that point only, has he atoned for the sin of Adam. So we just have to press pause for a second and say, what's going on that standing in a room filled with plant extract smoke has uh, the power to atone for sin? And then we start to see, you know, the first temple, the first temple at least, the coals uh, were made from these acacia trees. They had these special processes to make the coals. We also see these coals had the power of atonement because later on, uh, angel takes the coals from the altar and touches it to the lips of a prophet and it atones him. And even so much, the Talmud says, the daughter of the high priest of Israel is called Bat Paniel, the daughter of Paniel. And we say, why is she called the daughter of Paniel? And the Talmud says, because she, he serves in the innermost sanctums. And the language they use for the innermost is a language of, you know, you have an experience before God. Wow. Um, so that said, when we're looking back in, you know, in these days where, you know, given that you're also, you know, researching a lot of the plants that create, you know, hallucinogenic properties, which, you know, we deem kind of taboo in the times we're living in. But are you saying that, you know, in ancient times, these were used as an essential part of spiritual elevation? Crucial, essential, and we see it across all world ancient religions. Uh, this DMT chemical is also central to the South American uh, rituals of their ayahuasca brew, which is the main chemical of it. So if you really look at it, all ancient cultures were really uh, surrounding the reality of there's a place in our brain called Eden, an eyeball in the middle of our head that's shut, and there are certain plants that have keys into the locked part of our mind, and ritual was created created around that across all cultures, including the people of Israel. We're now obviously in the time of Mashiach, according to, you know, all of the writings and everything. So this kind of dovetails into this process we're in, that, that people are publicly going to shamans and doing a walk, oh, I can never pronounce it. Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca ceremonies is very, like, commonplace now. Because no one deserves to suffer. We've been suffering in our heads for such a long time, and these plants are known to hyperactivate our frontal cortex of our brain where we store trauma. And so people can let go and actually refresh and restart their life. Right. And uh, this is why I'm trying to swap the phrase of uh, atoning for sin as erasing generational trauma. Because we know uh, whatever traumas our ancestors experienced from sin or from whatever is actually stored in us, and we're dealing with that today. Mm -hmm. So there are certain plants that will actually erase potentially pain and trauma that we're holding on to epigenetically for... Right, that going to a psychologist isn't going to fix. Right, so that's why I'm not seeing too much metaphysical realities over here in our Torah and the Kabbalah. I'm seeing a very grounded story about parts of the brain, ancient culture, and plants, and um, access to spiritual worlds. Wow, so interesting. Rabbi Harry, always cool to see you. You're amazing. Thanks again for coming. Awesome.